Um, we are about to start. Uh, good afternoon to those who are joining in. And uh, we are about to start in a few, in a minute, in fact, because it's one minute uh, to five. And so we will definitely start um, right on time. We are about to start. Uh, good afternoon to those who are joining in. Right, because it's one minute. Yeah, so the time, as you know, is now 5 p.m. And as per the agreement, we said that we would start at 5. Usually, then, we would allow those who are coming in late to join as we progress. So with those who are already in, we shall begin, no matter how few we appear to be. Yesterday, we had a conversation on Section A of the uh, PAC Manifesto of 1959. We talked about the question of slavery <coughs> and the question of racism. So today, we will um, focus on that of racism. But just to recap on slavery and um, colonialism, what we did indicate yesterday was that the whole situation in which we are as the people of Azania, as Africans, is as a result of a systematic exploitation of your resources of Africa. It is also as a result of stealing both land and labor, including abusing both land and labor destroying the environment, destroying the ecological systems. And that has been the work of the European expansion of commercial markets. So that's what we talked about yesterday. So today we've got to move a little bit further to talk about racism. I do want to indicate in the beginning that racism, colonialism and slavery have always worked hand in hand in the past. They have always complemented each other. In other words, so soon as there was slavery, racism came to the fore. As soon as the movement between slavery and colonialism came true, racism was always a category that was in place because by and large it was Africans who against whom racism was exercised. So as we proceed with the item of racism, let me just make some clarifications here about, you know, racism. So, so racism is not something that is in the head, in the mind of a white person. And racism is not an idea in the mind uninformed by anything. It is rooted in material interests. In other words, there is no way that you meet a white person and then they hate you purely and merely on the basis that you are black. There must be an underlying reason, an underlying cause for the ways in which interactions between white and black take place. There must be an explanation and that explanation is not in the head. It's not something they are thinking about. It is something that is rooted in the structure of society. In other words, racism is a structured phenomenon, but racism does not structure itself. It is structured by material interests. The second thing to say here is that the philosophy about the inferiority of Africans is not as a result of racist thinking. It is as a result of a need to justify the exploitation, the abuse, the mistreatment, and the making of the African as a subhuman. 
so so it, so it, racism then appears in the in the history as a justification for the way in which european whites are going to interact with the africans so it's not some some philosophy thought of prior you see so it's not something thought of before um you see in terms of the interaction between uh, black and white or african and european the third thing to say also is that racism does not necessarily um is not necessarily preceded by a theory about how white people feel about black people and it's not really about feelings it's not really about sentimentality about love and hate it's really about the material interests and just to illustrate this point to you very critically this is why in the 1920s when one of the first general workers strike broke up out in uh, azania white people were fighting because the chamber of mines which was basically formed in 1913 and coincided with the land act so when the chamber of mines was formed it was formed to protect white interests but those white interests were not necessarily white culture but it was white economy white political economy and so the idea then was to protect or to use the chamber of mines as an institution to defend and protect uh, the multinational corporations such as Anglo-American corporations, DBS, which had been established um, um, in the late um, uh, 19th century, and Anglo-American corporations, which was then established in um, uh, in 1917. So the idea was to protect those. So it was also to protect their profits as a white political economy. So in other words, the political economy had a white face. And so the need was to protect white people. So what then happened was white workers went on strike because the Chamber of Mines wanted to continue to make profits. And it wanted to lower the cost of hiring labor. And so they opened up the market a little bit. Opened the market for what reason? Opened the market in order to allow um, white people to extract more profits and in order to allow Africans to become part of the labor force, but also to underpay the Africans. Now, what did white workers do? White workers went on strike and they demanded that if the uh, the mining sector was going to increase, if the mining sector was going to increase, uh, uh, was going to open the labor market, and it, it then had to guarantee them as white workers that they were going to pay black people the same wages as they pay white people. But their reason was not necessarily because they liked white people, black people, it was precisely to protect their interests as white workers. Why was it important for them? It was important for them because there was a contradiction between white labor and white capital. But because capital had a white face and white workers were worried that capital does not care about the face of the person. So, so white workers were going to sacrifice their own race in order to rake and continue to make profits. And this is a very critical point to understand when we talk about the question of race. So, so the point I'm trying to demonstrate here is that white workers were not simply looking at us, uh, you know, as people of color and, and white capitalists who controlled De Beers and Anglo-American were also not looking at us on the basis merely that we were white or they were not driven by the idea that we were black. If they were driven by the idea merely and only that we were black and not by profits, then they would not have cared, where, they would not have wanted us to become part of the labor force in the mining sector. 
So the idea is they wanted to make money. They wanted to make profits. So this is why this point is important to demonstrate. So what I've tried to demonstrate is that it's not in the mind, it's not just in the mind of a white guy that they want to hate a black guy. And that's why the PAC has always taught a very significant lesson to the general members of society that we are anti-nobody, we are not anti-white people, what we are anti uh, what we are basically pro is the unity of Africans. And we were willing to allow anybody who was willing to respect Africa as an African nation. So it's, it was important for me to make a clarification of this question, even if I have taken a little bit longer. So today, there are two propositions in South Africa really on the question of race. The, in other words, the ways in which people generally think we can deal with the race question. The first proposition is that of a neoliberal multiracial South Africa. This position is based on the idea that we and white people must coexist and must live together. So this idea is based also on the notion that, you know, white people are already here and therefore we must build a rainbow nation and we can live happily ever after together. So this idea, in other words, claims that color is not important. It claims that color counts for nothing and therefore we must come together and build a South Africa that is multiracial. The second idea, and I'm going to deal with this idea very shortly, the second idea is that Color is at the center of politics. This idea generally is driven by some elements, uh, some um, elements which I should like to refer is, uh, to as sometimes, you know, a little bit narrow nationalist because they, they begin from the premise that color counts for everything and that politics is generally about color. But Peter Raborocco teaches us in 1959, shortly after the PAC was formed, that politics is not a matter of color. And uh, Raborocco charges Cliptown Charter for its idea that color actually counts for something and therefore we should embrace multiracialism as a view. So, with these two propositions, how does the PAC um, deal with the question? How does the PAC decide to, to solve the contradiction of race? So the PAC says that we believe in human race. We believe that there are no fundamental intellectual, cultural differences between Africans and Europeans. We hold that all human beings are equal, they are equal because they all have the same abilities. But we believe that what the past has done was to create a view that Africans counted for nothing because they were lazy and because they were um, unintellectual, they had low cognitive levels, and, and so on and so on. So our view is that we believe in the human race. We do not believe in multiracialism. So about uh, multiracialism said that uh, multiracialism was racism multiplied. In fact, that's what multiracialism meant. It meant that we must recognize that there were such differences, fundamental differences between some supposed groups of people that the best way to live together was to live separately. And this view actually was spearheaded by the Nationalist Party uh, when it won the elections in 1948. It uh, won actually the elections in 1948 on the ticket of separation, on the ticket of multiracialism. So multiracialism was not merely declared in 1955. It had already started, you know, uh, way before 1955. It had started, but it, but it had gained more traction and more support in 1948. You see, because white workers were scared that if the United Party 
won the elections against the nationalist uh, regime of Herzog. If it had won, they were worried that there was going to be a liberalization and an opening up of the market, um, labor market, which was going to increase competition between black and white labor. And they did not like that. So white workers voted for the Nationalist Party purely on the basis also that they wanted to protect their worker interests. They wanted to protect the interests of themselves as workers but secondly they were already in an advantage because they were white people so in other words it was important for them so it was advantageous for them in you know in two key respects first they were white second they were already workers who were getting better wages and that's why they supported the whole view of multiracialism so multiracialism was not a proposition um of 1955 or of uh, 1996 constitution which talk about the rainbow nation and so that's why the question of human race versus multiracialism is important so we then as pac coined the concept of non-racialism to respond to the question of racism and to respond also to the question of a rainbow nation multiracialism because we believed theoretically philosophically and ideologically but if you like also intellectually that the whole idea of multiplicity of races is no different from tribalism is no different from any sectarian politics and all sorts of sectarian politics seek to do is to divide and so multiracialism was always a view about dividing society. And that's why the Group Areas Act had been created long before 1948. For example, we saw a Job Reservations Act in the late 20s, uh, which ensured that uh, coloreds, Indians, and um, uh, white people and black people were separated. And so that's also why we saw forced removals of black African workers being pushed down to the rural, rural areas in order to ensure that the competition is as limited as possible. So, but what, what is also important about multiracialism is that within that context, people like Oppenheimer, and you, I think you should read this book um, uh, about the Oppenheimer dynasty, you know, because it's a very instructive book in a lot of instructive book in a lot of ways. So what had happened within this framework of multiracialism was that um, the United Party and later the Progressive Party had always been pushing this idea that uh, at some point we should integrate some white people, some black people, into the white community, into the white culture. Uh, but we should make sure that they are given a right to vote only uh, on the basis of their education qualifications. So that was their idea that they were peddling. And this idea was peddled a lot by Oppenheimer, um, you know, the father of Nicky Oppenheimer, uh, Harry at the time. So his idea was we needed to keep the multiracial setup but 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 as white people they then said they needed to integrate us into the white community so in other words you can already see within this kind of conversation they were having that their idea of multiracialism was the preservation of white supremacy the preservation of white culture the preservation of white domination and the preservation of the economic power but at the center precisely was to put up a structure an economic structure that allows the white structure the, the white uh, culture to continue to thrive so this is a very important point about multiracialism the second thing that he said within this setup and that white people all agreed on was the the idea of slowly and gradually you know welcoming us but what was the condition besides education it was that we should be civilized 
we should be able to appreciate the importance of participating into a parliamentary democracy. And by the way, that parliamentary democracy was organized by them. It was put together by them. It was put together by them for themselves and not for us, but certainly against us. And so we were then to be uh, integrated into white South Africa, provided that we could prove that we were worthy of doing so. The third element was that they were then going to use the education system to educate some portions of black people and Africans in general and recruit them through bursaries and, and, and integrate them and build what, Nikki, uh, what Harry Oppenheimer called um, uh, the black middle class. Because he recognized that they needed a black middle class, which was going to act as a buffer zone between the exploitation of Africans and the preservation of whiteness. In other words, in the middle of domination and supremacy and imperialism, colonialism and apartheid and racism was going to be the middle class. And the middle class would be given white education, white culture, and European values so that they can appreciate and become civilized and, and, and be able to function within a particular system that was designed for their own exploitation. So, so in other words, they would build a black middle class that would acculturate and assimilate all values, including, and most importantly, free market principles or capitalism, properly speaking. And so, so you can see the idea of multiracialism in history as touted by white Europeans, by the Germans, the Americans, and uh, the British. Touted as a philosophy, or as if it was a philosophy, when it was in fact an ideology rooted in the protection of white benefits, of white capital, uh, what today people often call monopoly capital. So let's get let's move a little bit further on this question and I think we're spending a little bit of time here because it's a very crucial issue to, to, to understand. So one of the then things that would be declared in 1955 and, and it's a very key issue. In 1955 in Clip Town they called it a Freedom Charter and Rabaroko decided to call it a Clip Town Charter. And one of our uh, leaders uh, decides to call it a freedom charter because that's basically what it did. What the freedom charter in 1955 did was to endorse racism by apparently endorsing multiracialism. So what it did was to endorse the view that there were separate groups, practically, philosophically and theoretically, that the best way to go or the best route to take was to preserve those groups. So the, the Freedom um, Charter, which we shall now always call the Clipton Charter or the, uh, the, you know, the Freedom Cheetah. What it did was to say that we, the people of South Africa, black and white, declare for the world to know that we, South Africa, belongs to all who lives in it, black and white. And so that was the framework. And this framework had run through from 1955 to 1991 in the negotiations to 1994. Um, and by the way, we also had to give uh, white people about 20 seats in parliament for which they were not voted for by anybody, uh, which is not surprising because in Zimbabwe the same thing was done you know, because that's how the negotiation takes place. So, so multiracialism was basically a setup always made to protect white interests. What else did that uh, multiracial setup say in 1955 and continued right to, 19, um, to, to 1996? It was then that um, they were going to then create conditions for the protection of national groups. Now, who are these national groups? Who are these groups that were there? These groups that were there 
were not the Zulu, the Xhosa, the Tswana, the Sotho, the Tsonga. They were not a particular tribal grouping. They knew to them, which is to white people, we were not uh, the Tswanas, the Sotos, and we were Africans. And, but they would call us black. And so they said, that, so, so they were creating that framework to protect minority groups. And these minority groups precisely were speaking to which group? And they were speaking to white people because they were a minority. But the most important thing which then came out in the constitution of 1996 of South Africa, the so-called Republic then, was that they were going to protect individual rights, individual property rights. Remember now, we as the PAC believe in the human race, not in multiracialism or in a rainbow nation, but they were going to um, protect individual property rights, one, to the group rights, which is the minority rights of white people. Now, two things are interesting here. First is that white people had already stolen the land. They had already settled illegally, illegally occupied and taken the land. Secondly, they were now given citizenship in 1955 because they were declared brothers and sisters with, along with Africans. But lastly and importantly on this question, they were now already... And this is quite interesting. The constitution now was going to protect their property rights. Now, their property rights as who? Not their property rights now suddenly as Europeans, but their property rights as South Africans. So they gain citizenship, but they still keep the property which they stole. They stole the land. Now, why is this important? This is important because in section 25 of the constitution, which is the property clause, um, the only way the Africans could be able to get that property or can ever get that property is through some kind of compensation. In other words, you can't go and take your land back from a white person because they are South African, first. Secondly, because they've got an individual property right over that property, which is historically not theirs, which is historically stolen, and presently maintained by both the labor of the African and, and basically through the constitution of the South Africa. And then there was an interesting element of this constitution of 1996, which talked then about the limitation of um, rights. So we could only limit the rights of white people, which is the settlers, a, as long as that limitation was reasonable, as long as it, there, were, there was no less restrictive means, and as long as it was in the best interest of, of the country, which is also what Section 25 actually says. So that is a multiracial setup. That is a setup that allows um, white people to keep the land, to keep the property, to keep everything in the name of being South Africans, one, two, in the name of being protected in the Bill of Rights. But three, in, ter but in, th in terms of the multiracial setup. So that's what the multiracial setup actually did. And finally then, which is the last point I want to make before we attend to, to questions. How then did we respond historically to this question as Africans? Robert Sobuko had made a crucial point already about multiracialism. He had said that racism, uh, multiracialism was a pandering to European bigotry. It was a means to safeguard white interests. Secondly, Raborogo had made the same point that politics was not a matter of color, but now color was being used as if it was a fundamental matter, you know, even to white people when we know that at the bottom, lying underneath this supposed color distinction uh, or the difference of pigmentation, what lied really underneath that was the protection of property, was the protection of the individual property. And this individual property, as I have said yesterday, can only be protected by a European 
um, you know, uh, 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 thought and the European market capitalist theory and market capitalist principle, which was touted by Stuart Mills in his book on liberty, on and and on, on, on in his book uh, John Locke on civil government. And this was also defended uh, very stoutly by people such as Thomas Paine. So in other words, you, you, you can see a pattern of the ways in which the Europeans understood property, the ways in which the Europeans understood the question of land, that according to them, individuals who had a right to a piece of land um, in total exclusion of other people, but secondly and importantly, uh, free market principles were important and therefore anyone who had a piece of land could develop this piece of land, uh, you know, uh, using particular instruments of production, including that land, to make wealth and profit. And so, 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 so the multiracial framework has always been meant to protect this particular view. So our view then as the PAC has been that multiracialism is a wrong philosophy, is a wrong theory, it's predicated on protecting white people. And if I can just make an example, that is why today about 72% of the land remains in the hands of 72% um, uh, of the farmlands, agricultural land and agricultural holdings, land holdings remain in the hands of uh, white people, white farmers. So for you and me in this country to eat, a white man must farm. If a white man decides to stop farming tomorrow, we will go hungry, apparently. And, and that was the mistake made by the governing party, the ANC, when it had its own conference recently, a year ago or so, and it said that it wanted to expropriate this land in such a way that does not hurt food security. Now, let's ask a simple question. Whose food security are they talking about? Who, who's the farmer, right? Who is this uh, farm owner, who, you know, who controls the farm? The, so, so that's a protection of white people under the multiracial setup. And that has been systemic, systematically the problem. So, but because today I'm not dealing with the land question, and I should propose to deal with the land question next week. But I'm just trying to explain how the multiracial setup has created a, um, a conditions for the protection and the retention of power, of colonial power. One of the interesting books that I would say may be important for you to read is one by Nkrumah who talks about... Um, neocolonialism as the last stage and the most dangerous stage of imperialism. His point is very instructing because what, what we come to see is that post-1994 peace was made um, and we had to make peace, didn't we? Because we were now South Africans all of a sudden. Everybody was a South African. The oppressor was a South African. They were brothers. We were brothers and sisters. You know, uh, besides the fact that some white people left South Africa, they couldn't care less. They couldn't even apologize. But we were also asked to apologize for fighting for our land, for fighting for the return for our, of our land. We were asked to apologize for bombing white churches and white, uh, uh, you know, stations and, and, and destroying basically white supremacy. So we were asked to um, say we were sorry. But that's all they had to do, really, isn't it? They only had to say sorry. They never returned the property. They never returned the land. And the only way they could not return all of these things is within a multiracial setup. Today, we are so obsessed with wanting to put a black man, for example, to become a CEO at ESCOM or to become a CEO in this or that company. Uh, we think that we are talking about transformation. We think we're talking about radical change. We even talk about uh, higher education transformation. We want to have black academics. We want to have black people in the positions of power. Well, I've got some news for us. 
Why don't we read the book on pitfalls of national consciousness? I think it's chapter three of The Wretched of the Earth by Fanon. Pitfalls of national consciousness. You see, because that is precisely what happened post-independence within a multiracial setup. You know, there were these are the serious pitfalls of our utter lack of understanding of what real change is about, of what a revolution is about. So we, we, we think that by putting a black man in a position of power, we can change a, a, a problem. We think by putting a piece of legislation that we can change a problem. We think that by putting a program such as an affirmative action policy, black economic empowerment and broad black uh, based economic empowerment, we think we can solve problems of this country. And have we solved the problem of this country? We have not. And we are far away from solving problems of this country. If we think we're going to solve problems of this country by saying that we want to have quotas, we want to have equity in the employment, we are delaying the revolution. We are wasting time. Now, let's be real. How many people are black? How many black people are farmers? Are they not also engaged in the exploitation of our people? Are they not exploiting the farm workers? Are they not underpaying them? Where are the farm workers as we speak? Are not the farm workers in the farmlands now as we speak working there very hard, sweating and getting paid peanuts? Is that okay? Is that acceptable? Is that okay and acceptable if a black man oppresses black people, Africans? Is that the way we want to go? We want to build black businessmen to exploit Africans? Is that the South Africa we want to build? We, we want to create a society in which, uh, you know, we are told that we are multiracial, but indeed we remain racial and, ra and, 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 and white supremacy continues. That's not how to solve problems. And so, so that, is our, that is our challenge with multiracialism. And I think now it's that time, as I, I'm going to try to wrap up, and it's that time where you can try can start throwing in questions that you probably have and um, I will try to answer those questions um, so you can start posting the questions but so I will say in conclusion that within this multiracial setup you can continue to have a bunch of black people who are in power in, in government and they can continue to give us an illusion that we are going to solve the problem. But we are not going to solve the problem. If you look at the current crisis, for example, of COVID-19, and you look at the implications of the crisis, you must have noticed that very rich people are now going to contribute to the fund. We are told that these are generous, good folks, and we must be grateful for this kind of thing. But what does this tell us, really? It tells us that we do have money to solve the problems. But this money is concentrated on few hands. This money is concentrated on a particular group of people who have a system, a history of systematic exploitation, dispossession, of our people so that is the challenge so let me then try to deal with the quest first question that appears here the question is how would the pac structure um how would the pac structure mzanzi if it were to be in power given its belief in the human race right so first of all, what you would need to do in order to solve the problems of the country, you have got to link um, race policy with education policy. You have also got to link uh, education policy with a land policy. In other words, you, you, you are not going to solve the problem of you know, the human race. You are not going to solve the problem of ensuring that there is through equality between everybody. In other words, you've got to shut down the entire vocabulary of multiracialism and rainbow nation. 
you have got to begin the vocabulary of human race. So how do you do that? Let me be quite succinct with you, very genuinely honest with you. All the things that society has learned, it has been taught at school, at primary, at university. What that means is that you've got to change the curriculum. You've got to change the things that are taught. You've got to change the concepts that are used in teaching kids at foundation phase, at, inter at, at intermediary phase, at um, senior phase, at college and at university. What this also implies is that you have got to begin to take control of the university so that you can teach the non-racial policies, the human race policies. But also you have got to equip the African with a particular education that gives them a particular skill, a particular set of knowledge, so that they are capable of running their affairs. There is this genuinely problematic belief in society. People think that, you know, they cannot run their affairs without the help of white people. They tell us, would, you know, it would be terrible. There would be terror if white people left us. Where does this come from? What perpetuates this type of thinking? Is it not the fact that we've not been taught appropriately at school to believe in ourselves, but not just to believe in ourselves, but to be taught practical skills of scientific development of tools of production. The question is to be able to have the correct tools of production. Remember, we have got minerals in this country which are exported as raw materials to Europe. You know, De Beers and uh, Anglo-American and all other various multinational corporations, they come here, they take stuff away from this country and they leave us penniless and they bring the stuff to us back very expensive. We don't have, you know, we don't control the manufacturing sector. We don't, I mean, how many machines are we able to produce as, as this country without relying from, from uh, imports? Right now, we are asking the Chinese and we are asking, we are a charity case, asking the Chinese and the Americans and the rest of the world to supply us with, uh, you know, produce for us sanitizers. We can't even produce sanitizers, you know. We, we have got to rely for things like ventilation machine from abroad. Yet we have implements underneath the soil. We allow companies like Total to explore wealth in our country. What have we been doing in the past 25 years to correct this kind of problem? So in other words, you can't talk about changing the structure of Mzansi without talking about changing the very essence of the structure of higher education. Do you know how many papers have been published by very educated professors and doctors in higher education? Millions of them. You find millions of data. You know, if you go to um, if you go to any institutional repository, you find millions of data, information. What does this research do? How many? How much research have we done in this country? We haven't. You know, we have done lots of research. That means absolutely nothing in many cases for what we need to do in order to save this country from multiracialism and these other terrible policies. So in other words, the point I'm trying to make to you, uh, Fezile, is that to solve problems uh, of Mzansi at the structural level, in other words, once you solve the structural problems, racism itself will absolutely go away because for a white person to be racist against you he relies on his economic power because you need him to employ you. And so he, by virtue of that very fact, has acquires this power, you see, over how they are going to treat you and me. And so that's where we need to be thinking about the problems of solving societal problems. We need to think about using power in government to instruct universities on what kinds of skills do we need. Now, I were to ask you a question as I finish, and I'm going to take a second question. I were to ask you a very central question. How many engineers do we have in this country? Does our government know how many engineers do we have? Does the government know how many engineers we need? Where do we need them to do what? 
if government gives students loans, which, are not, which is not supposed to be the case in the first place, but if government gives people loans to go and study at university, what happens when they get out of the university? Why do we have about 100,000 unemployed graduates? There is no plan. Absolutely no plan. No education plan. You know, it's just a business, it's just a business transaction between government and the university. No plan at all. You couldn't have a problem of unemployed graduates. You, as we speak, have people, you know, sleeping in bed, hoping to get jobs. These people are supposedly educated. What has gone wrong? So the problem is structural. There are some courses that are completely useless to, a, you know, to the development of society, which are taught at university, a waste of money even. But the most important thing that we have got, this country has got no plan in terms of what to do with those people. So, so that's, the, that's the real thing. So to, we've got to change the structure by linking education land um, together in order to deal with the question of changing the structure. And by changing the structure, we affect racism itself. We affect white um, supremacy. And we get into the position of expelling imperialism. The only way the Chinese could get rid of imperialism was to get involved into rapid industrialization, was to get into rapid industri industrialization and relying internally and not externally. We can't keep being a charity case of the Europeans. The second question to deal with is what kind of the uh, education system, the PAC, envisages. So, the kind of education system we envisage is one that has a socialist content because we want to build an Africanist socialist democratic Azania. Now, we say that we are Africanistic in orientation we say that we are socialist in content. So the content of our economy is socialist. But that socialist content of our economy has a great effect on society at large. And therefore, our economic, our, our education system must reflect the needs of society. Let me see if I can just give you a simple example of the point I'm trying to make. If you come to a local community and you go to university, why do you never come back there? But you've studied in that school that stay in that community, but you never come back. Are there no problems in that community? Is there no poverty there? Is there no unemployment there? In other words, the education system that you have currently does not speak to the local problems. You know, does not speak to the local context. You know, it, it preserves the status quo. Everybody is trying to go to Joburg, right? It's trying to go to Cape Town. It's trying to go to Durban. It's trying to go to the city. Because that's where apparently jobs are. Because everybody has been educated to seek for a job. Not to solve community problems. And not to create, and not to engage in productive labor. And not to engage in the development of productive tools. We are supposed to have people coming out of university, going straight where we know they are supposed to go, going back straight where they come from. In other words, a university must reflect problems of society. It must not reflect problems happening elsewhere in the mind of some European elsewhere in Europe. We've got to have an education system that speaks to uh, see, our kind of society which we want to build. So that education system must be socialist in content. And I should like to say that the question that you were asking, um, Tunzi, probably needs us to have a lecture on its own and, and talk about what is this socialist education? What does it look like? Because right now I'm giving you a description, a broad description with a little bit of an example. And maybe I can make you a last example here on this question. We had a problem of drought. Why do we have a problem of drought? Is it not a social problem? Why is it, don't we have engineers? What are the engineers saying? But before these engineers 
can be capable of solving problems of society what kind of you know socialist values of a political economy are they supposed to have because for me as an individual to be able to contribute to society i have got to have some kind of views about the world now where are the views of the world taught they are taught in school in university you are taught to be selfish at university you are taught to do it for yourself you are taught to be an entrepreneur to make profit and supposedly to create jobs and sometimes to justify exploitation of other people you understand so that is the real difficulty that we've got to deal with we have got to ensure that education system is socialist and has socialistic africanistic democratic elements in it because we want to develop in the final synthesis africanism develop an african personality an african personality is a personality that respects um that respects the fellow the, the fellow african and that works collectively to solve problems of society so that is the thing so uh, i'm not sure maybe you will need to repost uh, the other question it has flipped out of me the um um fizzily, the, the question about how did racism develop whose interest does it serve okay so the point about so racism developed within a context of um a, um, a political economy and history within the context of slavery the context of colonialism racism developed so my point has always been that people didn't just wake up trying to hate somebody there's no such a thing it's theoretically flawed and it would be nonsensical and i would challenge anyone really who says that i could wake up hating somebody <laughs> you know there's no such a thing you know racism developed within a context of relations between different uh, people of different skin pigmentations you know for example the the the, the coins and for example were uh, dealt with by the folks of the that dutch east india company when they came there they took over their land and uh, the cows of the Khoisan and the cattle had nowhere to graze and uh, th this for the simple reason that the other guys which were the dutch uh, the east dutch india company um folks that were there in the in the cape saw an opportunity an economic opportunity in the cape and they settled and that's where the issue really came in you know then the land was dispossessed and then they were now and the british were coming in in 1820 and they were pushing out the Afrikaner, pushing them out into the interior like in the free state and then suddenly today you've got people some a place called orania where you know african people are, are living you know most of them you know that's a problem so 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 that's the thing what is your take on the argument raised by other comrades that blacks can't be racist in this current setting of the world look the take of the pace is quite simple it's that racism is an economic phenomenon and, and I could have finished answering you by simply saying that statement. The point is that racism is an economic phenomenon. It is an economic category. For example, when I began, I made a point about how white workers, even though they are in, when their interests were at stake, not necessarily as white people, but as, as, as workers, they were willing to pull a racist card on one hand if the racist card was not coming in, they were willing to put um, an economic card and say, we are white, you can't treat us as black. Or if you're going to treat us as black, you know, give us a salary, give us a salary scale, make sure that you don't change or lower the wages. In which case they knew that even white capitalists were going to continue to employ white workers. Because the reason white capitalists wanted to employ black workers was so they can pay them low wages right and so it was beneficial for them to employ black workers for low wages but it was also a risk to them to employ them at low wages because they were risking you know industrializing and uh, increasing the working class uh, in the in the mining sector and so they were risking a revolution so in other words the, the calculation of a racist um is always about a material interest in other words no racist 
merely makes a statement. I know there's a guy who makes uh, a, a lady in Devon, like uh, Benny Sparrow, who makes a stupid argument calling Africans monkeys. That on its own is a problem of a, a particular different theoretical framework. And that theoretical framework is that people like Benny Sparrow are cultured and structured and therefore they are habitus, their disposition is full of the historical nonsense about who we are as Africans, about this idea that we are inferior. So racism takes fold within a particular economic context, and there can be no two ways about it. So, 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 so in other words, if I have then said, if, for example, I have no means of being, you have to have means to be racist. You know, you've got to have a, you've got to run a, um, a you know, a, a company um, and you've got to own the means of exploitation and the means of exploitation is economic power. You know, you can be, you can be a rude guy, you know, you can be a rude man, you know, but that does not make you racist. You can say all sorts of horrible things to white people without being racist at all, you know. Because, um, you know, I know, I mean, the, uh, I, I've looked at different dictionaries like uh, Web, uh, uh, Webster Dictionary, uh, Stanford and, uh, you know, Oxford Dictionaries. They all miss the point because they come from the premise of that privilege. They treat racism as a mere interaction, as a mere belief. In other words, they don't give it the foundational economic basis that make it possible. Now, if you don't believe me, I want you to imagine what would happen in a world where white people were in our position and we were in their position. And I can leave that answer to you to answer. Finally, what is the role of religion, especially Christianity, in advancing white superiority? What will our government do? Look, it's quite true. I mean, there's a, there's a serious history of use of religion um, to basically exploit Africans. And basically, let's just be quite uh, honest here. The, the missionaries were sent by Europeans specifically for the reason of converting Africans into Christianity, but it was made explicit to them that the way in which Christianity must be taught to the Africans must be of such a nature that specific verses must be picked to justify. And you've got to remember historically that people were not allowed to read the Bible. The Bible could only be read by the Pope or things like that. So, you, you know, you couldn't... Um, so you couldn't, you couldn't read the Bible and read it for yourself and interpret it for yourself. You had to rely on some guy who claimed to have more access to God than you do, as if, you know, God belonged to that guy. <laughs> you know, at all. So, so the challenge about religion is that it was used, it was always a historical, political, economic tool to lull and to use the Africans. And actually, interestingly, we had a... a uh, you know, a seer in the Eastern Cape by the name of, Nsik uh, of Nsikana who warned about the uh, coming missionaries with the Bible and, uh, and so on, <laughs> you know. And so religion has played a very central role in our exploitation. There's no one who can doubt that particular thing. Um, but you, I mean, you, you, you will note historically that uh, in, in the 16th uh, in the 1600s, in the mid of the uh, 17th century, there was a period of Spanish Inquisition. You know, in Spain, for example, they used religion to keep themselves in power uh, by, you know, beating anyone who was engaged in heresy and beating anyone who would not convert. So religion across the world has been used for various nefarious reasons. Um, of ex exploitation. In other words, religion like racism has been used in a particular way and it's a particular category. Uh, some people today still say we should pray for our leaders. In other words, they are asking us to pray for corrupt people, people who are in parliament and in government who are stealing money. They tell us that uh, if we wanted to solve that problem, we need to, you know, uh, pray for these guys. 
It does not work like that. You don't pray for a corrupt guy. I mean, even in religious terms, a, a corrupt guy would have to repent first, okay? <laughs> you know, and the best way to repent, right, is not to stop stealing, right? It is to get out of power. And it's not in the nature of the corrupt to stop being corrupt. It's in the responsibility of the, of the African to remove those. The final question, because we are, we are a minute left now. Um... Sobukwa said the word race has no plural form when referred to man. Absolutely, um, Tunzi, I mean, this was um, a central uh, uh, tenet of our thinking as the PAC. The founding fathers of the PAC, you know, we often say that they were intellectually far ahead. I mean, they saw that the whole facade um, of multiracialism was basically the pluralization of uh, a, a people and the categorization of people into groups. It was indeed, as Sobukwe said, meant to safeguard white interests. It has never been meant for any other reason at all whatsoever. And so, yeah, I mean, so that's, that's quite frankly very true. So in conclusion, what I've tried to show today was that the PAC believes in the human race, not in multiracialism, and we don't believe in the preservation of white interests, etc. And so for those who have come late, it's okay. You can watch the, the video. It will be replayed for you. Next week, uh, Tuesday, we are going to get to the land question. But specifically next week, we're not going to get into too much details. We're going to deal with the challenge of the notion of expropriation without compensation. We are going to interrogate whether it is possible to ever get the land through the use of expropriation without compensation and whether the constitution of South Africa is of such a nature that we should be able to get the land at all, especially if we look at the Bill of Rights, if we look at the Section 25 and if we look at Section 36, including if we look at other bilateral international treaties that this government have signed with various uh, countries like Britain um, and whether it is then possible within that context to really solve the problem. What would then I advise you to read in order to prepare for that? I would advise you to read chapter three of the report. It's a hundred page report, it's a little bit long, but it's okay, I mean, you can afford, I, I suppose. Um, read, download the high level panel report uh, of 2017, which I genuinely think that parliamentarians have never read, you know, and I think that's why they are clutching at straws on this question of um, the return of the land. Please read that document, um, and we, we will be looking at that uh, document specifically just as, a, as, an, as an initial source of reference. In, in critiquing the entire multiracial framework insofar as the return of the land is concerned. With these words, I'd like to thank all of you who are not members of the PAC, and I, I hope that we have treated you with dignity and respect. Our responsibility really is to educate and teach society, regardless of membership, wherever you belong. Ultimately, we want the unity of the African people uh, for the expulsion of the imperialist forces, colonialism, neocolonialism, and for the liquidation of capitalism and the establishment of the Africanist socialist democratic order. So for this, we are quite happy to, to deal with, um, to, to have had you in this platform. Thank you very much, uh, Sons and Daughters of Africa, and uh, let's meet next week uh, on Tuesday. 1700 hours as you see i start on time but i finish a little bit after the time which is three minutes past six but thank you very much is well it